Hey brother! Today I am so excited. We have made nearly 800 videos on this channel and somehow we have never talked about my favorite Disney movie. Oh, oh, oh man, just a little late, a little late. Let me get my seat here, my bad, just real quick. Ugh. Totally yeah. threw off my groove. Sorry! <laughs> The Emperor's New Groove. Holy yes, you may be excused if you were just magically turned into one. Cow, do I love this movie. Just in case you didn't get that joke. Hey, I've been turned into a cow. Can I go home? You're excused. What's completely vexing to me though is that I just got back from a full week at Disney World and not anywhere did I see a single trace of the Emperor's New Groove. And believe me, I was looking. I have some thoughts about exactly what the ride would be. Please remain seated and keep your arms and legs in at all times. Or at the very least, like a table service diner. Three liquors wearing pants, plate of hot air, a basket of grandma's breakfast, and change the bowl to a gill. Got it. I would totally order a basket of grandma's breakfast. How could this be? How could Disney's like best movie not have a presence at Disney World? Okay, so I have a feeling some of you back home are probably like shaking your fists angrily at me about like, you know, The Lion King probably maybe is the best Disney movie ever, but like arguably the funniest Disney movie ever. If you are somehow unaware of this gem, then just like stop what you're doing, pause this video and go and watch it. Find a way to watch it. I guarantee you will not be disappointed. Or just listen to this brief summary. The Emperor's New Groove tells the story of a spoiled teenage Incan emperor, Cusco, who gets turned into a llama and learns humility as he is escorted back to the palace by a peasant in his kingdom as he tries to become human again. I mean, it's a tale as old as time. I almost don't actually know how to describe it. Like the humor is just so well executed and so well layered that like, even after having watched it 50 times and that's like a low estimate, I'm still finding jokes I haven't heard before. It makes excellent use of the fourth wall and like plays around with the camera as part of the humor, which is particularly notable because it's an animated movie and there is no camera. Also, have I mentioned the shoulder angels? Raise the number two. Look what I can do. What? What does that have to do with me? No, no. He does have a valid point. It has actually baffled me for years that this is not considered more of a Disney classic. So I've actually done a little bit of digging and I think we can point the finger of blame at the hunchback of Notre Dame and Hercules. Sort of. The weird thing about it is that the fact that The Emperor's New Groove isn't a more prevalent film in the Disney archives is not actually its own fault. As you may know, after the death of Walt Disney himself in 1966, the animation department at Disney kind of went through a dark age that they wouldn't get pulled out of until a certain mouse detective and mermaid came to the rescue, full video by clicking the card. The Little Mermaid launched what is known as the Disney Renaissance, where in the 90s we had 10 movies in a row from Disney that were all back to back to back classics. This period of time, no doubt, redefined Disney's style and the peak of which absolutely came with The Lion King, which brought in nearly a billion dollars in revenue. So we're right in the middle of the Disney Renaissance, by far financially the most successful period of time for the company, especially in the animation department. The Lion King has just come out and is their most successful movie of all time, directed by Roger Allers. And who is directing The Emperor's New Groove? Roger Allers. This movie had every reason in the world to believe it was going to be the next big thing. Allers would actually start work on the project the year that The Lion King came out in 1994, but so much would happen before it's finally released in 2000. See, while post Lion King Renaissance movies did pretty well, nothing else ever really compared. Mulan and Pocahontas were both kind of salvaged by being added to the Disney princess line. And here's when we circle back to The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Hercules. The Hunchback came out and it was supposed to be a little bit more of a serious movie with more of a message that came with it. It, and it really didn't perform so well. And immediately after that, we have Hercules, which also falls short of its mark. Combine that with some lackluster test screenings and the execs over at Disney were starting to feel like the more serious vibe that they were going in wasn't working and they were going to need to pivot. So they changed gears and decided that their new Incan movie at the time called The Kingdom of the Sun should be more comedy based. The original plot and cast looked a lot different. David Spade was still supposed to play 
the Emperor, but his peasant companion was supposed to be played by Owen Wilson, and instead of being an older, kind of humble character, he was just supposed to look exactly like the Emperor. Wow. The story was very similar to The Prince and the Pauper, where the Emperor and the peasant were going to switch places so the Emperor could just have more fun and less responsibility. All fun and games until a significantly more ambitious version of Yzma was going to try to summon Su Pei, the evil god of death. Part of this plan did still involve turning the Emperor into a llama and blackmailing the peasant Emperor into doing her bidding. But get this! No Kronk! <gasps> I know! How could you not have Kronk? I mean, the guy does his own theme song music. Anyway, after four years of production and various rewrites, it was 1998 and very clear that the movie was not going to be on time for its 2000 scheduled release. At this point, Roger Allers, the Lion King guy, wanted more time and producers weren't able to give it to him, so he left. And from there, the movie went through a massive overhaul. Owen Wilson was dropped from the cast, John Goodman and Patrick Warburton were added to it, Pacha was made older, and the movie was transformed into a buddy comedy way different from the original goal of the film. Meanwhile, in the greater world of animation, it just so happened to be the case, and somehow it seems like it always is, that there was another production company making another buddy comedy about an Incan empire. The movie is called The Road to El Dorado, and fun fact, the blonde guy Miguel is actually played by Lockhart. It's actually also a very good movie, and I highly recommend you check it out. But that movie was being produced by Jeffrey Katzenberg, the same guy who was behind the whole Ant's Bugs Life debacle, full video by clicking the card. Katzenberg was determined to beat the newly named Emperor's New Groove to market, and totally did. And speaking of A Bug's Life, since The Emperor's New Groove had been in production, there was just this small little company that was kind of starting to emerge called Pixar, had started production, and they were already three films deep. So if you're The Emperor's New Groove, Here's how things are going. Don't tell me. We're about to go over a huge waterfall. Yep. Toy Story, A Bug's Life, Toy Story 2, and Ants all came out with better technology. Yep. Another Incan Empire buddy comedy beat us the theaters. Yep. Sharp rocks at the bottom? Most likely. Bring it on. Disney had started production on this movie thinking it would be another Lion King. They had the same director, Sting, was doing all of the music, forgot to mention that. And they were still riding high on the success of the Disney Renaissance. Then during the time of productions, the animation department started to see a decline in returns. Pixar had entered the market. Another competing studio had beat them to market with a similar idea. And their grand Incan adventure had been transformed into a buddy comedy. So when it finally became time to market this movie, Disney instead diverted its funds to market 102 Dalmatians. You know, the other most quotable Disney movie ever. And as a result, The Emperor's New Groove only ended up bringing $169 million in at the box office, which would have made it 10th out of 11 during the Disney Renaissance and only beating the rescuers down under. So yeah, I can kind of see why Disney doesn't necessarily consider this movie a classic. But remember, this video is not about what ruined The Emperor's New Groove, because despite all of these things, and it seems like a list of very bad things, the final product was still amazing. I love this movie. This video is about how it's the most underrated Disney movie of all time. No, maybe it's not The Lion King, but like I said earlier, it is easily the funniest Disney movie. It's not laugh a minute, it's like laugh a second. Out of that measly $169 million worth of revenue, I personally was $6 worth of it. And I still quote this movie to this day. Oh, she knits? Crochets. Crochets, nice. See, when I was 10, I didn't think that was that funny, but give it 18 years and let it marinate for a little while, and that was the number one quoted thing at last year's Family Christmas. True story. Fortunately, even though it's not prominent at Disney World, it does go on to have a pretty decent legacy. In 2001, it was number one in home video sales, both across DVD and apparently VHS was still a thing at the time. It got a sequel, Kronk's New Groove, because Kronk. Kronk here. And a show on the Disney Channel called The Emperor's New School. For my question of the day, where does The Emperor's New Groove rank amongst your favorite Disney movies? Is it first or first? Leave your thoughts in the towel section down below. And speaking of first, we're going to be doing our first ever Super Carl and Friends meetup this summer in Washington, D.C. On Saturday, June 16th, we will be renting out an entire movie theater so that Jay and I can go and watch The Incredibles 2 
with you guys. After the movie, we will be hosting a meet and greet so you can come and hang out and take pictures and have exclusive merch swag type stuff signed by us and it's gonna be so much fun. And more importantly than us is meeting just all of the other Super Carlin friends. This community has proven to be just incredibly cool and fun and accepting and just open to meeting friends and friends. The point I'm trying to get across here is that it's going to be a fantastic time. If you would like to get early bird pricing on tickets, you can click the link in the description down below. Guys, as always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you'd like to see some more Disney drama action, you can click right here to see A Bug's Life versus Ants and that whole crazy story, or right here to see the mouse that saved Disney. But Jay, that's all I've got for you today, man. I will see you on Tuesday.